The insight. insight. The insightum. Podcast. Genetics. Human. Archaeology. Denisovans. Neanderthals. Metabolism. Ancestry. Where in the world did we come from? I am. Unique. DNA. Genome. From Austin, Austin Texas. Texas. This week, Neander Me, Part 1. Okay, I'm Spencer Wells. I'm the founder and CEO of Insightome, and... I am Razib Khan. I am the director of content at Insightome. Awesome. Well, today we're going to talk about one of those burning questions in human evolution, certainly over the last decade or so. What does it mean to be, you know, 1%, 2% Neanderthal? Yeah. So... That's well, a big question. It's a big question, and it is relevant for our company because we have a product related to it. We do. We have a Neanderthal app, which will tell you not only that percentage, but answer that question, okay, what does it mean for me to be 1% or 2% Neanderthal? So what are the traits that I got from a Neanderthal ancestor? So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but more broadly, what, is, what does this even mean? Yeah, what does it mean, Spencer? <laughs> well, so... You you started off like from the genomic perspective. What right. are we talking about here? Like percent of your genome, mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. is this found in the world, and all that stuff. You know, with this sort of thing, the analogy that I like to use, or the mental model, would be: um, let's go back sixty thousand years, and you have a count or a list of all the individuals that you descend from, and how many times you descend from those individuals. Let's set the context. So humans originated in Africa. Anatomically modern humans originated in Africa. As far as we can tell. Yes. At least 200,000 years ago. Yes. Possibly more with that Jebel yes. Earhood find it, it, in Morocco. It's getting pushed back. But at least 200,000 years ago, humans in Africa. And there is some sort of exodus, some sort of migration around 60,000 years ago that takes them from Africa to the rest of the world. Yeah. And what happens then? There was some mixing. So basically, um, you know, you can say like 1% to 2% of your genome, if you are outside of Africa, is Neanderthal. That now, means... let's define what a Neanderthal is before we go any further. And is it Neanderthal or Neanderthal? I say Neanderthal because that's the German pronunciation. Yeah, I, you know, I think Neanderthal is kind of what the cool kids say. Well, it, it, so the German pronunciation, it was the original specimen was found in the Neander Valley mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Germany. And Tal would be the German pronunciation for, you know, valley in yeah. this little local dialect. So that's why it's called Neanderthal. But because it's spelled with a TH, people say Neanderthal. Yeah. So what is a Neanderthal? They're human cousins, basically. So yeah. we share an ancestor with them in Africa, as far as we can tell. Probably this individual we call Homo heidelbergensis or yep. antecessor or something that existed 500, 600, 700,000 years ago. And they left before we did. Yeah. So long before this 60,000-year time point that we're just about to get into, there is something that evolved into the Neanderthals that left Africa maybe 400, 500,000 years ago. Yep. And what yep. happened to them after they left? Well, I mean, they adapted to local conditions is what happened. So a lot of the things that we identify as Neanderthal, um, and I will I will use the, the soft TH to add some diversity here, um, <laughs> but... Uh, Neanderthals, you know, we defined them and discovered them, quote unquote, in terms of fossils, you know, on the order of a century ago, right? We didn't have DNA then. We didn't even understand what DNA was. Uh, so they're defined by their physical characteristics, which are which are quite distinctive. They're a very robust human species. And I, so they're I, heavily built. Yeah. And they've got the famous yeah, brow ridge. They have the brow ridge. They're very robust. The middle of their face projects out, you know, so... Uh, there's a lot of arguments about whether you would recognize a Neanderthal or not if they wore a suit and were walking down the street. In fact, there are pictures yes. showing that. You can find them on the internet. Yes, and I think it depends on where you live. And, you know, if you live in a cosmopolitan urban area, maybe they could pass. On the other hand, they do look really distinctive. Um, we are a relatively flat-faced lineage compared to them. And so... Why did their faces project more? I mean, that that's kind of an mm -hmm. ancestral state. So if you think about like monkeys, other apes, yeah. their faces project a little bit more than ours. Yeah, yeah. And we've lost that over time. Why did our faces become flatter? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there's arguments about neoteny or pedeomorphy with human beings. But so the idea that you evolve um, to look more uh, juvenile. Yeah. Look like yeah. The, the child version of the species. Yeah, and, you know, there's still variation um, among modern humans, too. I mean, in terms of the Neanderthal face, from what I'm to understand, and I am not a paleontologist, they had really large noses. And one hypothesis is they lived in a cold, relatively dry climate. Which would make sense. Yeah. So they're not living in the tropics in Africa. They're Mm -hmm. living out in Eurasia. Mm -hmm. So they leave, and over hundreds of thousands of years, they adapt to this colder climate. Yep. You know, are we in an ice age when they leave? I forget the exact dates. I think think we were. And then we came out of it, and then we went back into 120,000 years ago-ish, and so on. And so they basically adapted biologically over hundreds of thousands of years to life in this cold Eurasian zone yeah so mountains and forests in europe and maybe steppe lands and tundra and maybe even high mountains Mm -hmm. in the case of asia and then we come out and we encounter them at that point sixty thousand years ago as you were jumping into your story yeah yeah. i stopped you i went straight into the genetics it's kind of weird though to think about that you know right now we are the only species walking around on planet earth Mm -hmm. that we call human yeah okay but at that time, there were two species, and we can get into what a species actually means. Yeah. But basically, there was you know this Neanderthal population that had been separate for a long time, and we encountered them. And God, it must have been crazy. Like oh. you know, they look like us, but not quite. Sort of. Yeah. They don't speak like us. Mm-hmm. What about brain function? Because they had literally yeah. bigger brains. Yeah, they had bigger brains than modern big... humans did. Yeah, and you know, I mean. You know, you, I know you know the Spencer, but you know some um, some cranial anatomists have looked at Neanderthal skulls and thought they might have had um, certain strengths or weaknesses compared to modern humans. I mean, it's really hard to tell. You have to look at the inside of the skull. It's not phrenology, but you it's know. it's kind of bordering on it. Yeah, it's it, you know who knows, right? So in terms of where I was going, basically, all these like fifty or sixty thousand years ago, if you had a hundred ancestors, one or two of them would be Neanderthal if you are not of overwhelming African ancestry. Okay, so the Neanderthal admixture took place in the location where Neanderthals live. That makes sense. So, you know, people living in sub-Saharan Africa didn't ever meet Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. No no interbreeding there. Yeah. It happened somewhere in Eurasia. Where, Where did it happen? It actually did happen multiple times. Um, okay. Almost certainly, and and we're just just to like get down to brass tacks. Yeah, we're not talking about just like meeting up for dinner. No, we're talking about like we got it on. Yeah, the music the, the music started playing. <laughs> you know, um, and like cave wine was flowing, <laughs> and you know by the end of the night, and, they, and there were children. Yes, that, and yes, that resulted from that that yes. union. Yes, and they were adopted into the human species which is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Otherwise, we wouldn't have retained the, the genetic link. Yeah. If you read fiction, uh, you know, with Clan of the Cave Bear, some of these other ancient novels, uh, a couple of years ago, um, as in like before 2010, I think most geneticists and many paleoanthropologists, but not all, would say we had no Neanderthal ancestry. And so these prehistoric fictions were kind of seen as uh, more like science fantasy but now that we know there's admixture, uh, it's very interesting to reread some of these things because they might actually be playing out scenarios that occurred. In terms of where the admixture happened, probably like definitely in the Middle East because it looks like everybody outside of Africa has a certain baseline. And when you take everybody outside of Africa, the last place that they probably had common ancestors would be in the Middle East. And Neanderthals did exist in the Middle East. The Shanidar Cave in Iraq is pretty famous. So um, Neanderthals are a cold-adapted human species, right? They're a cold-adapted ecotype. And as the ice moved north and south, they also moved north and south. So African human lineages seem to have expanded and regressed periodically, and Neanderthals moved in sync with them. And so it's probably somewhere in the Middle East that there was at least one admixture event. We know that there were other admixture events uh, in a Romanian sample there was an early modern human and when they took the genome they looked at it and it looked like maybe his a great 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 grandparent or so was a neanderthal like this is not in the distant past like this is within a few generations yeah this is within the oral history of this so lineage you're talking about an individual that was much more than one or two percent oh, yeah. Neanderthal. yeah yeah they yeah closer to like 10, 10%. yeah yeah 10 yeah. percent and so this was this was someone who was product of a recent mixing. Now it doesn't look like those people, it, 
the first modern humans in Europe left any descendants. So that probably didn't have an effect on modern Europeans, but it shows it happened multiple times. Uh, there is some circumstantial evidence. There's some complications here, but maybe in Eastern Eurasia, there was a second um, admixture with Neanderthals. That That is why East Eurasians tend to have a slightly higher percentage. But, um, you know, that's, that's to be fully explored in, in the near future. But probably definitely in the Middle East. We left Africa. There were people outside of Africa. And, you know, people did what comes naturally. They got makes, busy. Yeah, they got, it makes sense. It makes yeah. sense. So it's not surprising. So, so the big question is, if we were able to mix with the Neanderthals so easily, like this happened multiple times, were they really a different species? Yeah, I mean, this is a philosophical question. Uh, I'm definitely... I definitely lean towards not a different species. And the way I think of it is, okay, they diverged from us 500,000 to a million years ago, probably close to like 700,000. If they were not of our particular lineage, would we define them as a separate species? I don't think we would. If it was a big cat. So one of the nomenclature, you know, attempts in, in the 80s, for instance, we talked about a Homo sapiens sapiens, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Yes. Do you think that's probably closer to the truth? They're well, like a subspecies or, you know, a regional group, very yeah. divergent regional group of I prefer of that, but okay. I'm not a paleoanthropologist, so, you know, we don't get to make final calls on that. We're geneticists, and I think geneticists, we tend to be lumpers more than splitters, right? And so lumping and splitting is a taxonomical debate on, like, how many species you have and, like, how fine-grained you go. I'm not, I don't like to go very fine grain because, I mean, frankly, like all these taxonomic categories are somewhat artificial. And, you know, if we could have offspring with them, to me, I mean, the reality is like, you know, it depends on what lineage. But for humans, like if you could have fertile offspring with another population, to me, that counts as human. And Neanderthals were very successful. They were around for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, a lot longer than we've been around yeah, as a species. Yeah. So, so they were uh, incredibly successful. Yeah, they were very successful. And, you know, how we interpret the data is obviously conditioned by how we view this population because there's all this evidence now that they were much more culturally complex. Yeah, and, so there's evidence that they created art. Yeah. We have evidence from Teshik Tash in Uzbekistan, which is one of the easternmost Neanderthal sites, a child that was buried in a ceremonial way, surrounded by, I think, goat horns. So they had some sense of an afterlife, perhaps, yeah. you know, which yeah. is a very human characteristic. Yeah. So what would they have been like? You know, they, they sound kind of human. You know, we're coming out around 50, 60,000 years ago. We're these tall, thin savannah hunters. And, you know, we come out and we encounter these guys who are burlier. You know, they're cold adapted. They're yeah. stronger probably because the bone structure suggests they were more muscular. You know, how did they talk? You know, how did, how did we yeah. converse with them before, you know, the deed happened, so to well, speak? Well, I mean, you know, even before you can communicate verbally with a population, uh, gestures, mannerisms, you know, there was trade between Europeans and native peoples, even when they couldn't understand each other in terms of barter. Uh, so this sort of interaction, I mean, didn't even necessarily need, you know, complex verbal communication. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they, although we do think that they they spoke. Yeah. I mean, I mean they, they had the, the vocal structures yes. to produce speech. They yes. had a hyoid bone, this yeah. bone that you have in your throat that helps to modulate sounds and all of that. And there's this like awesome video from the BBC <laughs> that's out on the web and we'll include a link in the, the blog post. But like they had really funny voices. Yeah, they did. So, wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, if there was an SNL sketch about the first meeting with Neanderthals, it would probably be like, wait, they sound like that? <laughs> so it's this kind of wheezing, high-pitched, oh, hello, I'm a Neanderthal. Yeah. yeah, so so I mean, anyway, for whatever reason, we decided that um, we wanted to mate with them. Different species, that's to be determined by the paleoanthropologist, but genetically speaking, they're not that different, except they are, because we can detect that they're different. So let's think about that. How did that come about? Because, you know, people, geneticists have been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. A lot of people spend a lot of time, you know, during the time that I was in graduate school back in the early 90s and then postdoc mid to late 90s, looking for evidence of any Neanderthal DNA, and they never found it. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, the, the first study that came out was done by Matthias Krings in Svante Papo's lab when he was at University of Munich. So it's before he moved to Leipzig, which is where he is currently. But they looked at a sequence from 
ne- a Neanderthal bone. And it was actually from that, that type specimen, that original discovery from the Neander Valley. And they were able to, using very careful painstaking techniques, extract DNA from that and amplify the mitochondrial DNA, which is kind of what everybody studied you know, up until the late 90s. So this little structure within the cell tells you about your mother's mother's mother. It's a purely maternal line. And they found a Neanderthal type that was vastly different from anything that you see in the human population. So yeah. it's not part of the normal continuum of variation in humans. It's way far outside that, that distribution. And what they inferred from that was that modern humans don't have any Neanderthal DNA. So yeah. why did that story change a decade later? One issue here is even when that originally came out, there were many population geneticists who said you cannot reject the hypothesis of admixture simply based on that one locus. Why is that? Because there's going to be, basically, drift will eliminate a lot of mitochondrial lineages Because naturally. the population size, you're only, you know, in terms yeah. of who's passing it on, you're really dealing with half of the total yeah. population, and then some women are not going to have yes. female yes. kids and so on. So, yeah. So the effective population size, which is a population genetics concept that we yeah. will eventually explain on the blog post, but basically, you know... That accentuates the effect of something we call genetic drift, the random, you know, change in frequency of lineages over time due to a sampling effect, due to a small, finite population size. Kind of complicated. Let that sink in for a minute. But basically, simply because you don't see any mitochondrial variation that falls within the human range doesn't mean there couldn't be other parts of the genome that do. So for that you've got to look at the rest of the genome. Yeah. And that's impossible. Yeah, like, or was. what? I mean, this is what we said yeah. back in 97. It's yeah. like, oh my God, this is a huge thing to get a Neanderthal mitochondrial sequence, but there's no way we're going to get yeah. nuclear sequences. So how did that happen? Well, I mean, technology got better, right? Um, basically, the, the people in, um, in Fonte Pablo's lab got really good at amplifying ancient DNA. Now, um, just a personal anecdote, I was actually... Uh, at a talk at Berkeley in 2008 that Svante Pablo gave on Neanderthal ancestry. And they had not done too much analysis of the whole genome yet of the autosomal, but they had gotten more mtDNA and confirmed the original finding. And uh, I remember he was very confident um, that there was no Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans in 2008. And then what happened over the next couple of years is uh, the first results came back and they kept seeing a subtle, I mean, initially, from what I'm to understand, they thought that there was something wrong in their data. Okay, so what were they seeing? Uh, They were seeing that populations outside of Africa on the whole genome were very subtly shifted towards Neanderthals Mm -hmm. when you were comparing the DNA. Very Okay, so this is genome-wide. Yeah. They're doing a principal components analysis, yep. which is a way of you know, comparing very complex data, yeah. multivariate data. Yeah. And they had an what, genome. what they saw is that Europeans and Asians were shifted yeah. a little closer toward Neanderthals. How were they determining what a Neanderthal should look like at that point? What were they shifting toward? They were shifting towards a, a legitimate ancient genome. Like okay. it, it was Neanderthal DNA that they had extracted, just like in '98. Okay. Um, you know, they had gotten empty DNA, and you know, one of the reasons that empty DNA was so useful is it's copious, mm-hmm. right? So it's really easy to get. It's yeah. low hanging fruit. Autosomal DNA, nuclear DNA, is not as copious. Yeah. And so now, instead of using inference methods. And there are ways you can look through the genome and try to figure out whether this is mixed from another lineage or not. Basically, in the 2000s, there wasn't enough statistical power, it seems, to resolve many of these questions very well. Mm -hmm. But when you have an ancient genome, a reference that you can compare, they had a Neanderthal genome, right? They could confirm that this was diverged from modern humans over 500,000 years ago. So let's talk about how they got this ancient genome. And we're not going to go into huge detail on ancient DNA right now. We're going to do another um, podcast on that at some point. But... What happened? How did, how did they get... I mean, think about it. You, you've got an individual who dies, and they decompose, yeah. and maybe they become fossilized yeah. after enough time. Doesn't the DNA just go away? Doesn't it just, like, degrade to the point where you can't look at it anymore? Yeah, well, I mean, so my understanding, and, you know, I don't know the biophysics that well, is uh, DNA is a pretty robust macromolecule, right? I mean, there's a reason that we use it for genetic inheritance, and that's because it's not that fragile. 
it's you know subject to the same um, half life phenomenon as many many chemicals in terms of its structure. So yeah, you lose a lot of the DNA initially, but there's always a residual for a long time that persists. And you know one of the issues with relatively recent fossilizations is often they go through a stage called subfossilizations where not everything is mineralized. Right. And so if not everything is mineralized, there's still organic material in there and you can get some information out of that organic material. Now, a lot of the time it's contamination. It's not human. Yeah, because you think about, you know, these these specimens, these bones that they're extracting the DNA from, you know, in the case of the type specimen that was discovered in the 19th century. You know, you've got yeah. generations of paleoanthropologists who are like handling this and, yeah. you know, looking at it while they're smoking a cigarette and, you know, passing it around the room and all this stuff. And so, you know, there's a huge amount of modern material that it just seems like that would overwhelm any ancient material. How do you account for that? Like, how do you kind of cancel out the modern stuff and, and zoom in on the, the ancient DNA? Well, I mean, but the modern stuff shares relatively recent common ancestor, right? So the modern stuff would be, you know, a tenth as different at most as the Neanderthal stuff. So you would be able to see that all the modern line all the modern fragments would coalesce together. But another issue is with all the bacteria and all the other stuff in there, that's going to be way different. So the Neanderthal is kind of in an in-between position. Like it's different from anything you would see in modern humans, but it's still obviously kind of human. For some more perspective, we reached out to anthropologist John Hawks, who's joining us on the line from South Africa. John, go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. I'm a, a professor of anthropology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison um, for now nearly 25 years. I've been working on the record of human evolution, starting with Neanderthals and, uh, and then branching out into other things. Done a little bit of work in genetics, and, uh, and now I'm engaged in field research here in South Africa, where we're working at the Rising Star site. Yeah, so you're Skyping in. It's great to have you join us. Thanks for staying late. Um, it's, it's early here in Austin, Texas, but uh, what is it, about 6.30, 7 o'clock at night over there? Just coming up on 5 o'clock, and, and we've just finished excavation for the day. Big day today, really cool stuff going on underground, recovering hominid fossils. It's, you know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so tell us about Naledi. Big find announced a couple of years ago, um, and you were collaborating with Lee Berger. So where does where does Naledi fit into this this hominid bushy tree that's that's being fleshed out? Sure. The really cool thing that we discovered about Naledi last year, we were able to finally, and it was very difficult, determine the age of the chamber where we first recovered Naledi, the Dinaledi chamber. Uh, those fossils date to around 236,000 to 335,000 years ago. That's really, really unusually late compared to how primitive morphologically they look. They look like they're some sort of very primitive looking, you know, very stem of Homo erectus or, or something like Homo habilis, you know, that kind of primitive, small brained, early Homo kind of creature. But they do have some derived traits, traits that are very human-like, more human-like than habilis in some respects, their hands, their teeth. So we looked at them, and they're a bit of a puzzle. Finding out that they're late tells us that there were diverse hominins that were here in Africa, uh, certainly sub-equatorial Africa, as recently as 200,000 years ago, the time when our own species, modern humans, are really beginning to originate. So it's a... Uh, it's been a puzzle for us. You know, the, the issue is, as you say, in the recent past, we weren't the only species alive. There were other hominin species, you know, walking around on Earth um, as recently as 30, 40,000 years ago, including our friends the Neanderthals. You mentioned Naledi around 200,000 years ago, but tell us a little bit about who the Neanderthals were. Yeah. So the Neanderthals were, you know, they were like the mirror version of ourselves in some ways. You know, we look at them and... The, the anatomy that they have stands out in some ways. They have a brow ridge. Their faces sort of project forward a bit. Um, you know, they have this sort of, you know, now very stereotyped, but kind of classic caveman look is, is how it's come into our culture. Um, but their brains are large. Their behavior, now we're finding these traces of behavior that we, we previously didn't appreciate, that they're able to do these sort of complicated things, like making mastics and glues out of pine pitch and, and or birch pitch, excuse me, and and they're collecting shells and using them as an ornament. It's it's like the kind of stuff that we used to think makes us human, 
they do sometimes. And it's like this sort of, I don't know, you know, if, if it was a comic book, you'd imagine a parallel world where these other humans are living and they're very much like us, but they're different. And that seems to be the story that's emerging about Neanderthals. They lived across the western half of Eurasia. Um, they were you know, related to us fairly distantly. Maybe 700,000 years ago we shared an ancestor with them. But they were doing these interesting things that we look at in the record and we say, wow, why are they gone? Hey, this is Razib, um, John. So uh, it's great talking to you. I have a, a quick question, I guess. Um, related to this idea that they were more advanced or more like us than we had previously thought. You've been in this game for a really long time and seen a lot of changes, um, at least from the genomics end I can speak to and you know all about. Do you think some of this is simply perception and seeing what we want to see? Um, because, I mean, a lot of the data has been around for a while, right? I think that a lot of people came to this with the perception that, or, you know, maybe... An assumption is a better word, that what we were going to do was we were going to find the, the Rubicon, the big barrier that human evolution crossed. And on our side of it, you're modern human. You, you've got everything that modern humans have. And on the other side of it, you're some sort of primitive, archaic human, and, and you don't have some critical things that humans have. Hmm. I think the story is much more complicated than that. I think that when we look at modern humans, we're very diverse. Mm -hmm. There are some things that are universal. You know, we all use language. We all, you know, have, have what linguists call fully modern language. Yeah. Um, we're all cultural beings. But I don't imagine that to be an either or. Yeah. I imagine that it's a continuum of that in our evolutionary history. When we look at the record as it's emerging now, I think you see less of some behaviors in the past because they were evolving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And cultures obviously have their own dynamics, yeah. but, but abilities for culture must have been evolving too. I think it's a mistake to look for a clear dividing line. I think these things are always going to overlap. Yeah. So you think this, this concept that was popular maybe 20, 30 years ago, this whole notion of a great leap forward, as Richard Klein put it, is, is probably not correct? There wasn't like a single genetic revolution that led to fully modern human behavior? Yeah, I think it was the many steps forward, and some of them were backward. I think, I think that you know, this is a, it's, it's, we know that you know now looking at genomes, we know that there's no mutation yeah. that makes this, you know, and and the number of of unique SNP variants that that modern humans everywhere in the world mostly share is super 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 small compared to Neanderthals, and there may be things we haven't found, but. I'm imagining that this is a, a complicated series of events which aren't necessarily shared by every population all the time mm -hmm. and that are going sort of fitfully in mm -hmm. a direction and not necessarily the same direction. Um, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. you know, evolution is not like the omega point where yeah. we're ending up there. Yeah. You know, it's just a temporary phase that we're in now. Yeah. And, you know, that really begs the question, um, was there a species barrier between humans and Neanderthals? I mean, should we be talking again about Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis? Or should we, you know, elevate Neanderthals to species status as we had done until, you know, very recently? I'm so excited about that question right now, because that seems like one that we're going to solve soon. You know, you look at what we have of Neanderthal genetics in us. You know, it's a small fraction in people today and super, super small in sub-Saharan Africa. But but in other parts of the world, you know, it's one percent, two percent, three percent. It's small. But look across the genome and see which parts of Neanderthal do we have. And you see these areas where there's almost nobody has, mm -hmm. you know, large parts of the X chromosome that nobody has. Mm -hmm. Good hypothesis. I think David Reich has been especially sort of forceful in, in talking about this hypothesis that maybe that's the case because there's some sort of fertility barrier that is actually impeding parts of that chromosome from coming into our species. I don't think the data are quite yet there to say that that's definitely mm -hmm. what's going on, but it's a possibility. And I think that we're at the verge of testing it. If yeah. that's true, this is speciation. You know, I think that's the test of speciation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, a biological species concept. I mean, that is, that's where the rubber meets the road. 
yeah, the idea that we are now, you know, potentially going to demonstrate one way or the other, you know, whether there's some sort of fertility barrier, fertility, you know, sort of valley between Neanderthals and us, that's showing the evolutionary dynamics of speciation. And if, if we're there, I'm totally comfortable calling them a species. Um, but if we're not there, I'm totally com comfortable calling them something else. <laughs> Go where the data takes you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We're, we have a unique advantage, right? Because at this moment, it's not like 100 years ago where we had to take a position and argue it. You know, it's like, OK, we, we can test this. Yeah. Well, let's let's rewind a little bit and, and give that historical context, because your own Ph.D. thesis advisor, Milford Wolpoff, argued for many years that we descended in part from Neanderthals. And now that seems to be the case. Yeah. You know, I, I think. You know, I was involved in this argument for for such a long time. You know, as I was a student, that was the big issue. You know, what was modern human origins? What was the role of Neanderthals in our ancestry? And and those were the newsworthy parts of anthropology. You know, cover of Newsweek stuff. You know, this is the sexy part of our science. But when it came down to it, you know, you were dealing with a fragmentary fossil record. You know, Neanderthals are the best case because we've got skeletons of them. But in those critical times when the last Neanderthals are living and the earliest modern humans are entering Europe and <laughs> coming into contact with them, you've got a few teeth. You've got a couple jaws. You know, it's just the sort of stuff that we complained about earlier in the fossil record. If you try to get time resolution on what happened to Neanderthals, it's the same problem. Mm -hmm. So it was always a weak data situation. And so as genetic data started coming online and you started to see, you know, the complexity of this picture. Oh, yeah, we got Neanderthal. I celebrated. I got to tell you, I was walking up the hill to my building in Madison and this song comes on the radio, right? Mm -hmm. Don't stop believing. <laughs> and <laughs> and I actually came to my <laughs> eye, right? Because all these years, you know, I sort of believed the Neanderthals were important. And I wanted them to, you know, to be here with us yeah. and, and there, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, this picture was not what any of us would have predicted. You know, I predicted that you would have a surplus of Neanderthal genes in Europe because Neanderthals are European. And it's not the case. So, yeah, I mean, really exciting time. And the genomic information is just coming fast and furious. And, you know, David Reich seems to have like a blog post in Nature, effectively. I think you Yeah, it's a column. It. <laughs> it's his column in Nature. <laughs> and maybe, maybe I should talk to him on how you get into Nature. I, I can't seem to crack it. <laughs> exactly. But a few years ago, this completely new creature turns up, one that we never expected to find. Um, from a pinky bone in a cave in Siberia. Tell us a little bit about the Denisovans. You've been to the cave, haven't you? Yeah, I've been to Denisova now a few times. And, and you know, for me, that was a complete shock. This is 2010. And Johannes Krauss uh, uh, is, is working on this gene sequencing in, in the Max Planck labs, lab, Svante Pebo's lab. And, um, and they're, they're trolling around Central Asia for promising samples of bone and these guys working on ancient dna they're looking for the coldest sites they for the first time don't need complete morphological information you know any bit of bone will do and they're testing these things and they test this pinky this little distal phalanx from from denise of a cave and they find oh my god this mitochondrial dna is is different from us it's different from Neanderthals. It looks like a, another kind of human. They intensively looked at that. They were able to successfully sequence most of the nuclear genome of it pretty rapidly. And, and they showed that, well, this is interesting. The mitochondrial DNA looks super different. The nuclear genome also shows these guys to be a third group but a group that has this sort of connection to Neanderthals. You know, mm -hmm. they, they have a, an early initial evolution in common and then branch off. You know, and here's this group. We don't know where else they lived. We don't know what fossils to attribute to them, except the ones from Denise of a cave that have DNA. Um, but by gosh, in Aboriginal Australians and in Highland New Guinea, they have a, a sort of 5% of this genome in them today. It's a story that 
you know, it came completely out of left field. None of us were looking for this. Yeah. I've, I've had, you know, right now, seven years later, this is part of my worldview. So I'm like, you know, you know, okay, yeah, we should have predicted this, you know, part of what led us to Naledi in a way is realizing that the story is untold. There are things that we haven't discovered yet, but the, the Denise of a story is so cool because once you have a third group in that situation with DNA, you start to find that they're mixing everywhere. You've got Neanderthal genes in the Denisovans, Denisovan genes in humans. You've got Neanderthal genes in humans. You've got some ancient third, fourth group that seems to comprise a little bit of the Denisovan genome. It's like, it's like nothing that we ever predicted. The Upper Paleolithic and, was, um, yeah, a very promiscuous time in human history. It turns out, <laughs> it was wild. It, it's certainly true. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's these yeah. it's it's this weird contrast of of the branches that existed for hundreds of thousands of years. That's not today's history. Yeah, we don't have modern human branches that have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. It's different from today, mm-hmm. but. But that was a profound time of contacts and mixing between these very different groups. And something must explain that. And what explains it we right now don't know. That's the frontier. Yeah. Yeah, it's an exciting time to be working in the field. Now, you touched on this briefly a couple of minutes ago. One of the surprising things about the Denisovans, I mean, everything was surprising, quite frankly. But one of the really surprising things was, as you said, you know, the highest levels of interbreeding seem to have been not in Siberia, which might be where you would expect it to be, but east of Wallace's line. So over in yeah. New Guinea and Australian Aborigines. Why do you think that is? Because, you know, there are lots of theories going around, but no one knows. You know, yeah, I, I say what I wish were true. And and I don't know that it's true, but I think it's a hypothesis that that deserves some consideration. We don't know what was in India. Um, the hominin fossil record in India is almost non-existent. Um, India was a large hominin friendly area, you know, and and there must have been hominins there. We've got some archaeology from them, but we don't know who they were. I sort of imagine that an eastern version of Neanderthals, this is a really nice place for them. And modern humans pass through the Levant. They mix with Neanderthals a bit. They continue on further to the east. They hit India. They're mixing with something else, the Nisevans, presumably. They continue on into Southeast Asia, into island Indonesia, and they're carrying those genes with them. But later, there's additional waves of modern humans that largely cover up the evidence in India, in Southeast Asia, in most of Indonesia, for that matter. And it's only at the very end of the first wave that you sort of have a surplus of Denisovan genetics. I like that model. I think it it, it appeals to me because I I see those waves of movement in Europe. And it seems to me like this, this is a similar kind of situation, potentially. But but it's also possibly true that Denisovans inhabited a large part of of what is today Indonesia, areas that that were once connected to the Asian mainland um, and today are are separated as islands. It's even possible that you had an initial modern Denisovan mixed movement that made it into Wallacea, that that a later pulse of movement was the first Australians, but carried mixture with that group with them. I think it's just it's too soon to say. Yeah, that's exciting. Because because we you know, I think that we'll find out a lot of this stuff. Um, but but it's also, you know, now would not be the time. Yeah, I tell yeah. people this in Africa. Now is not the time to think we've found the last. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep collecting data until there's no more data coming in. That's exactly right. I mean, yes. You can never predict, but <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm talking to people all the time about our fossils in, in South Africa, right? And they're like, "Well, mm-hmm. surely this is the last." <laughs> I said, yeah. this, is the, "This is this may not even be the third. You know? Wait, are you are you talking to Adam Rutherford because he's trying to get another book finished and he doesn't want to do revisions? Because <laughs> I mean, that has been a problem in the last couple of years for people trying to finish books on human evolution. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah. Chris Stringer told me yeah. it was rather frustrating to finish a book and then like. Okay, got to get out the second edition soon because um, yeah, it's kind of like Truman Capote within Cold Blood, where he's waiting for the ending to yeah, yeah. So you might you might have to wait a little longer, you know. 
Um, do we you... may be we may be approaching the fossil singularity, and then no <laughs> yeah. one takes... the fossil singularity. <laughs> now that is a term I have never heard before. I like it. So, um, speaking of species, do you think Denisovans and Neanderthals were separate species since they are closer in time? You know, I, I'm really, you know, I've I've taken on board this paper by Alan Rogers that came out last yes. month, and I did a little right. commentary for it. Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't know if I'm fully convinced by their model, but their model is Denisovans and Neanderthals, when they separated from the African ancestors of modern humans, that event, that separation seems to be something like 700,000 years ago. Yeah. When they separated, they they were a bottlenecked population that population lasted as a joined bottleneck small population for a very short time yes. you know maybe a few thousand years at most yeah that, and was... then they separate yeah if that's true then a lot of the things that they share the fact that we look at them and see that they have this deep branch in common those are all things that got fixed during this short period of time when mm -hmm. genetic drift was really strong when they were able to fix a lot of new things yeah and and if they've actually been separated for that period of time, I see no reason to expect that Denisovans are going to be a different story from Neanderthals. Yeah. This seems like three species emerging in these, you know, sort of maybe their own little places yeah. uh, as opposed to, as opposed to two, um, the Neanderthal Denisovans being together. Um, but I think again, the test of this is going to be genetic. Yeah. We know less about this now for Denisovans because we haven't got the depth of genetic sequencing in Australia that's going to tell us what we have from them, you know, with great resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, again, we're going to test it. To be continued next week, part two of Neander Me. If you have another population which has lived there for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, well, why reinvent the wheel? The trajectories that a hominin-like form could follow. You know, we're one of them, but there were others, and those others were here recently. For more information about Insightome, our podcasts, and our genetic products, check out our website at insito.me. That's I-N-S-I-T-O dot M-E.